Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Shelley. Yeah, so this is definitely a technology that can scale, as you guys are about to find out. Um, so Mike and I had the pleasure of meeting, what, a couple hours ago for the first time? <laughs> Walked the building a little bit, got to know each other. Um, so welcome, glad you're here. Thank you, Shelley, thank you. thanks for having us. Thanks for letting us do this tonight. Um, we'll talk till about, for about 30, 45 minutes or so, then take some Q&A, and then let you guys ask uh, Mike a bunch of questions. So uh, my job's to get out of the way and let this gentleman uh, educate you guys and, and teach you a little bit. But let's start with the technology. So why don't you tell our assembled guests here about NanoShield? Sure. First of all, thank you all for, for having me here. This is the first presentation I've done in person in a very long time. Yeah. So uh, most of my presentations have been without pants, so it's very, it feels very weird <laughs> to have pants on. If, if I turn real quick, I, it's probably my kids coming in, but uh, I still have that, you know, uh, that reflex to look backwards and say, my, my seven-year-old's right behind me. He is, by yeah. the way, he's behind me. <laughs> No, it's, it's great to be here. Um, you know, I, I love Aggieland. I, I can't wait to start getting getting very involved in what everybody's doing and giving back. Um, so Nanotech, we're a material science company. Uh, we focus on nanotechnology around insulation and fireproofing. So we're one of the top, or we are the top fireproofing and insulation molecule on the planet, or at least that's what I tell people. I'm pretty sure we are. Um, we, have, uh, we have a molecule that can be embedded into a wide range of construction and building materials. So once we embed that molecule into the construction or building materials, it becomes fireproof and insulative. And so what's cool about it is we can fireproof anything from the state of California, which we're working with, um, to chemical plants. I'm going to a, a vineyard here in about three weeks and we're fireproofing a vineyard. So if anybody wants to help me apply it, you know, we're looking for service hands. It's a great vineyard. Um, and what, what, it's very adaptable technology. So we can embed it into drywall. Uh, when we embed it into drywall, the drywall becomes fireproof. It insulates better than uh, the insulation that's actually in your house. Uh, we can embed it into paints. So when we embed it into a paint and we coat a substrate, that substrate becomes fireproof. We can embed it into epoxies, into resins, uh, a wide range of construction and building materials. So it sounds like a really cool technology, and it is, and it is something that keeps me going every single day. Um, to wake up every morning knowing that we have a chance to not only reduce energy consumption, but to truly fireproof the world, save lives, uh, you know, save infrastructure, save buildings. Oh, man, I can't believe I fell into this thing. It is, it's something that's going to truly, truly change the world. Uh, every startup does think they're gonna change the world. Uh, we, we're, we're gonna do it. Um, it's, it's that special, it's that special of a technology. Um, it'll fireproof to any carbon-based fire, so it fireproofs to about 1800 degrees Celsius. Uh, carbon-based fires burn about 1200 degrees Celsius, and it's environmentally friendly, so there's no what are called volatile organic uh, t toxins in it. Um, it's all inorganic, so that means we can coat and work with just about any material in the world to fireproof it. Um, so it has a lot of special properties. And then it's also very insulative. So it works with a what's called low thermal conductivity. So it has one of the lowest thermal conductivities on the planet, uh, even lower than the NASA aerogels. And then it has a very high emissivity. So that means as a heat flux or, or a flame is introduced, it works like a mirror and it reflects that heat away from the substrate. It's not time dependent, which is really cool. So you'll hear a lot of, you know, a lot of, um, you know, one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour ratings. Once we reach thermal equal equilibrium, it just lasts. So it's not just time that we're giving people, it's truly gonna preserve the structure of the building or whatever it is that we're coating or embedding our molecule into. Uh, what else? We can spray it. We can spray it on, uh, you know, from a $100 machine that we buy out of Home Depot. So it, it has, you know, a lot of robust applications when it comes to actually getting it out into the field. And, you know, we're overwhelmed with the number of people that are wanting to work with us. Um, it's, it's incredible. We're working with about 35 Fortune 500 companies right now. Uh, we have NDAs with 35 Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we have development agreements with some of the largest chemical companies in the world. So we have these tremendous tailwinds you know, behind us. Now, I'll pause there because it's been uh, quite a journey to get there. And you know, for, for the students that are in here, 
it is an incredibly difficult journey. There's ups and downs all the way through it, but I see it in your eyes. I see I see it in in your guys' eyes that you're 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 ready to go after it, and you know the ups and downs are a part of it. So that's a long-winded answer as to what we're doing. Um, but yeah, essentially fireproofing and thermal insulation um, and being the best at it. It's fireproofing the world, no big deal. Yeah, right. It's easy stuff. So um, let's talk IP really quickly because. There's got to be a bunch of smart people in countries all over the world who are doing similar technologies. So how do you protect your IP internationally with this? Is it even possible or you just have to get out ahead of everybody? Yeah, so for those getting into the startup game, the best money you can spend is on a really good attorney. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, there's probably, you know, three or four name brand firms that you would probably want to go after. Spend the money, um, it's worth it. So we, we spent the money early on to protect our IP. Uh, we, have, we have about a dozen patents filed right now uh, with about a dozen more in the pipeline. It's difficult internationally. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of countries out there that want to work with our product that we just simply won't at this time. Um, and there's no such thing as, you know, as like an international patent. So you have to go from country to country. You gotta be strategic about it. You know, you don't, these things are very expensive. You know, they're gonna cost you $25,000, $50,000 every time you do it. So you have to be strategic about it. You have to think about which markets are you going to enter and be intentional about it, saying who is, who's our target customer there? Um, you know, how are we actually gonna execute? What's, what's the execution strategy around it? Once you have enough, you know, once you have enough um, information to say, yeah, this is a country we want to enter, then you th throw your attorney a bunch of money and then they get it done with you. And then it lets you sleep at night, right? You know, I, I hate attorney bills, but paying for, you know, a top name brand attorney that's gonna protect you over the long, long run is, is a worthwhile investment. Yeah, very cool. So is this something that you want to, um, I'm gonna circle back to the, to the beginning story here in a minute, but I wanna stay with the technology for a minute. So is this something as a, as a company owner that you want to own the company, grow the company, have it be a worldwide brand, or do you wanna get it up and running and sell it to a big name that's out there? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a C, I, I think being aware of your strengths and weaknesses is really critical, especially for you know, startup CEOs. Um, I'm a CEO that can take it from zero to you know something that's 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 you know sizable. Once it gets into kind of that operational and day to day, I'm not the guy to run it. You know, so I have I have a runway of probably the next four or five years, and I know I'm not the guy that's going to take it to that next iteration. Um, it's just one, I don't enjoy it, and two, it's not my strength. Right, my strength is taking it from zero to something. Uh, and then somebody else will take it from something to that next level. So we have we have a lot of options. You know, tomorrow we're doing a lunch and learn with our largest competitor. Um, they're about a twenty billion dollar company, and we're doing it one. I mean, everybody knows the game that we're in, so we're doing it one just to say. Well, they were very interested in what we're doing, so they have about 50 engineers and scientists joining us. Um, but the, the reason that we're doing hey, is- you're, you're how big? How big is your company? Uh, we, have, we have 10 people. Yeah, you know, yeah. All 10 of them show up, and you have them bring your family and friends, yeah. like to show them force and numbers a little bit, or is it gonna be like you against 50? Well, my wife and three kids will probably be joining, Perfect. and you know, yeah. my nine-year-old is my CTO, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so, so we, we don't know yet, so we're playing the field. So, right. you know, we're playing the field, we're looking, we have a lot of strategic partnerships that we're creating now uh, for an exit event potentially, um, but this is something that, you know, we truly think we can get to an IPO stage as well. Okay. But I don't know, I don't know yet. Uh, we're still early on, so we're just kind of playing the field a little bit. Yeah, you can, and there's so many different directions to go. You talk about building materials, for example, right? So those of you who are not in construction, when you build a building like this, you have to have fire ratings, right? So it's a fire rating is a one hour wall or a two hour wall or whatever, and the fire marshal's gonna check that, the city's gonna check that. Uh, and you're saying that it's a whatever you want it to be wall, right? That it simply will not burn. You know, so most of these, the drywall in here, for example, is designed to withstand a flame for a certain period of time, but then it is going to burn. The structure will burn. The whole idea with, with the firewall or the fire rating is to give people time to get out of a building and before, you know, before they perish, obviously. So there's smoke issues, there's a VOC, volatile, volatile organic compound issues, right? This doesn't emit any smoke or hardly any smoke at all, no VOCs, yep. and it keeps the structure from burning. 
I mean, that's phenomenal. It's an amazing technology. So you can go on his website. It's nanoshield.com, I think. The nanoshield. The nanoshield.com. And you can see videos of um, them putting flame to board, flame to foam board, flame to an egg that's coated in this stuff. And all these other eggs are melting. And this egg's just sitting there going, you know, just not doing it. Um, so it's amazing stuff. So um, let's circle back to how you said you fell into this, right? So education, uh, A&M, right? Right. We're in Aggie, right? 2006. Yep. yep. In obviously in in something having to do with thermodynamics and <laughs> material science, right? Yeah, definitely not. I okay. my sure. I, I failed chemistry multiple times, so don't tell my investor that. But they they know they know yeah. they know what they hired. Yeah. So I graduated uh, 2006 from Texas A&M with a computer systems degree. Uh, did my MBA at Rice University. Um, graduated from there at 2012. Started off uh, my career at National Oil Well Varco. So at, at NOV, I was I was put into leadership positions far before I was capable, um, and so it allowed me to fail really early. I was a you know 23 year old kid managing 50 people. Um, you know I, I don't know how that happened, and I made every mistake in the book. But it it set me off a path of you know what, if you fail early then you learn from those failures. Um, and I was, I was put in charge of their innovation program globally. And that's where my passion for innovation and ideas came from. You know, it came from as an entrepreneur where, you know, we have funding, we have, you know, internal funding, but we want to be an innovative company. That's where my real passion for um, entrepreneurship and innovation came from. Then I moved over to, to Halliburton, uh, and that's kind of where the relationships within Halliburton uh, you know, started. I led, a, uh, led about a $700 million P&L there, and then also moved into to some, innovation, you know, some innovation spaces. You know, on the surface, everything was great, uh, but there was something inside of me. There was just something inside of me that said, uh, th there's gotta be more to what is going on in my life. And, Luckily, I have an incredibly supportive spouse. Um, I, I try not to get choked up telling this story, so I, I'm going to try my best. Uh, yeah, I was sitting in I was sitting in my Halliburton office, you know, looking at my paycheck, thinking about my benefits, you know, thinking about my two kids at the time, and saying, "Man, there's no way that I'm going to be able to, you know, do this and you know follow a dream." I tell you, kid, kid you not, at that exact moment, my wife sent me a text message and said. I support you, go do it. I started bawling like a baby, just bawling like a baby. One, because I, I married, you know, definitely married up, but then two, like, oh man, now I have to go do this thing. She supports me. Um, and then- Now I have to do Yeah. It. There's no excuse, right? Yeah, and, and you know, going home that night, uh, my, my daughter, Clara, she was, you know, one years old and I was working, you know, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Went home, I uh, was, you know, I was too late for my daughters to put, to put her to bed. I was holding her in my hands and I couldn't recognize her. And I knew, I knew at that moment, you know, something had to change. I wanted to be control and command of my own time. Even though I was I'm working more hours and crazier hours than I've ever worked in my entire life, I haven't missed a soccer game, rarely missed soccer practice. Uh, I pick my kids up from school every day, drop them off every day. Being in command of my own schedule was what drove me to do all of this. And you were how old when you made that decision? Uh, so I'm 37 now. So we did it probably about when I was 30, something about like 30. that. 30, yeah. yeah. So not 23, right? You don't have to be an entrepreneur at 23. I mean, it's not, you, can, you can definitely do it, but some people start 30, 40, even 50 or later, right? So you can do that. Um, and I don't know anything at all about a supportive spouse in entrepreneurship, even though she's sitting right here. Very, <laughs> very similar story, right? So uh, very, very similar story to that. Um, uh, where basically, you know, she just said, absolutely, you know, quit your job. And she was unemployed at the time when she told me to quit my job and we had two kids at home and all this stuff. So I'm right there with you. Um, so let's go back to A&M and you're studying computer science, right? And you want it to be what? Well, I wanted to be a vet, actually. So I, st I started out. I started out. In, well, first of all, I, di I didn't get accepted directly into a and I had to do the blend team. Um, so I did the blend team where I was going, uh, you know, 80 percent of my hours at blend and then 20 percent at A&M. I wasn't a very good student in high school. Um, 
So I had to go that that route. I I desperately wanted to you know be a full time student at A and M. That's all I woke up for you know every moment. Um, and you know my grades were okay at Blinn, but at Blinn I had my very final semester in order to transfer in I had to get a 4.0. I've never got a 4.0 in my entire life. You know I'm a 2.0 type of guy, but that one semester I got the 4.0 and then transferred you know all the way into to A and M. I, I told you I you know I cry when I talk about my wife or my kids. I also cry when I talk about Aggie Land because it's just oh it was you know such a journey, especially Aggie football. I cry a lot for Aggie football. We all cry. <laughs> <laughs> Different reasons, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up in El Paso. Yeah, El Paso. I grew up, grew yeah. up on a border town, El Paso, Texas. I didn't yeah. know I was a white guy till I got to a and <laughs> I, I, I thought all my all, all my friends just tanned a lot better than I did. Um, there you go. So yeah, no, no, I grew up, you know, as you know, surrounded by you know yeah. different um, um, a lot of diversity. You know, all my sure. friends were not white. Uh, all my best friends that I still have today, you know, have a lot of diversity, you know, in them. So I think that those formidable years, you know, really shaped me. And my, my dad was a minister. So my dad was a minister. And prior to that, he was a, a missionary. So we would travel the world every month or, or uh, dur during the summers, th during the summer months, we'd go to kind of the worst places on the planet. You know, we'd go to third world countries where you see kids with their distended bellies. Um, and I didn't know that at the time, but that was what was shaping me to be an entrepreneur. You know, my, you know, being a missionary, if you think about what you're doing, you know, you're raising money so that you can feed your kids. When my, when my dad retired, he was making $30,000 a year and he thought he was, you know, the richest person on the planet. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to sell an idea and you're going out there and grinding and getting it done. That's what my dad did for 30 years. And so looking back, even though he wasn't in the business world as an entrepreneur, you know, he was an entrepreneur for something else, right? And that's kind of, I think looking back, that's what really shaped me was, you know, growing up in that situation, we didn't have money. Um, you know, going to Whataburger was a treat. You know, all, all of the, when I brought my wife home back for, for Christmas, uh, you know, Christmas one year, she's like, this is where you live? There's bars on the windows everywhere. You can see a strip club across the street. I mean, what's going on here? Who am I marrying into? But those shape you, those shape you. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, to answer your question, that's kind of where I grew up in my formative years. Oh, very cool. So I'm trying to figure out why or what, right? There's a better question. What did National Oil Well Varco, because National Oil Well, by the way, is a, is a huge conglomerate, right? They own, I don't know what, 40 brands in the oil field services business, you know, tubular companies, inspection companies, drilling, completion, offshore engineering, onshore engineering, all kinds of stuff, right? Huge yep. company. So they come to A&M and they hire this computer science guy. Why? Why did they, why did they hire you in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I look back on that and ask myself the same question yeah. you know, a lot of times. And what was the job? What was the job you were being hired into? Yeah, so I was in the corporate engineering technology group. So that corporate okay. engineering technology group, um, at the time, they had 100 ERPs that NOV was working for. So at the time, the job was to consolidate those 100 ERPs into one ERP. Uh, so they, they brought a kid in to, I guess, do all the, you know, all the keyboard crunching. Okay. Um, and yeah, and then from that, um, there was a new chief technology officer that came in. Her name was Hega Cavernalin. She's one of my best friends that I've ever had. Um, she, you know, she spends, she'll spend Thanksgivings with us sometimes. Um, she believed in me. So there's not a whole lot of things that I'm good at, but I'm pretty good at drinking beer. And the other one is arm wrestling. I, arm wrestling wasn't a, a thing that I could do for her, but drinking beer was one. So yeah. I, I took her, you know, I took, I said, Hey, I have this idea for you. Uh, I took her out to, to, to a bar. She likes, she's Norwegian. So she liked to drink, drink a lot too. And it was about two o'clock in the morning. And I said, Hey, I got an idea for you. And she said, well, I'm at the office at six 30. So you got four hours to prepare and present your idea to me. So I stayed up all night, put together, you know, put together some slides, put together some thoughts. I said, here's what I want to do. I want to create a global innovation program where we gather the ideas from the, from the fringes of our company, you know, not the traditional people that have the ideas, gather the ideas from the fringes, bring them in and create a process to commercialize. And I showed up very, very hungover at 7 a.m. It took about 30 minutes and she said, ah, let's do it, you're hired. Company-wide announcement, you know, a week later where I became, you know, the director of corporate product management. It's one of the, one of the things I have 
framed in my in my uh, office, my home office, was because she was the first executive, first you know, real heavy hitter to believe in me. And I think she's the one that set me off for the career trajectory that I had very early on. How long had you been with the company when that happened? About two years. So you're 25? That was 25. 24, 25? About, right? yeah. Barely get into a and right? Barely. Barely. Computer science, go, you're two years into a huge company and you get a break, right? So what the break is that you know, we, we say it all the time is that there's, there's rule number one, right? Rule number one is people do business with people they like. So she liked you, right? You went out, you hung out, you had a beer, you're a real person. You weren't just, you know, nine to five and get the heck out. She liked you, she saw something in you and then people take chances. So that's pretty amazing that a company that big would take a chance on that. You know, a person of your age and really only two years experience. So why, why do you think, what do you think she saw in you? I don't know, I guess I tricked her, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know, all right. I don't mean to get you to pat yourself on the back, but it is that's a pretty, pretty phenomenal story, so. It, it's collisions, you know, especially, you know, especially the young entrepreneurs in here, yeah. create the collisions. You know, if, it's, if, it's, if it sounds like it's something that you're not interested in, or if it sounds like something that's, uh, you know, not up your alley, do it anyway. You never know when you're gonna find the next Hega. You never know when you're gonna find the next new material, the new technology. You never know when you're gonna find those things unless you get those collisions going. So I, I would say collide. Collide. So I, had, had you already gone to Rice at that point in time or not? I had not, yeah, no. So, so okay. again, yeah, so she, um, I had no plans of you know going to Rice, but she said, if you're gonna be, an executive in our company, you better you better get your MBA. So she to cover her yeah. trail, right? It's like, oh, who are you hiring? Yeah. So so she, uh, you know, I'm so grateful for this every day. You know, she she paid for my MBA to you know to get it at Rice. Full time um, or executive? The executive program. Okay. Um, yeah, forever grateful to her. I, I call her every week because she truly set my career off on, on the trajectory where it is. Yeah. So and and what did you study at Rice? What helped you at Rice? So rice, rice is cool because uh, one, they have a bar right on campus, which is yes. pretty cool. Uh, and that's where a lot of collisions happen. Um, a actually- Valhalla. It's, yeah, Valhalla, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, rice is great because one, it's you know, relatively you know, small. Um, so it, it, has, it has the ability to create those collisions very easily. It also has you know, the kind of like the name brand of rice. When I tell people I went to rice, they're like, ugh, did you play football? Like, how did you get in, you know, right? <laughs> So, so it has kind of like that feel for it. You know, I wasn't great in, you know, I didn't go an entrepreneur route. I didn't go, you know, marketing route. I focused on, you know, the finances, kind of like the hard sciences of business. Um, but Rice was where my first idea came from. Rice is where I had that first opportunity to have an idea and potentially execute on it. Yeah. So you stayed with the company during this time, right? Kept doing your thing and, you had about 60,000 employees, I think, something like that. And you're trying to consolidate all this innovation. And did you have some successes while you were at NOV as, as far as getting innovation into the field for those guys? If I'm honest, it was probably mostly failures. Um, well, that's how it works, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so we created a, a system and a process to generate ideas, but we were so focused on the idea as opposed to the problem. We were so focused on the process as opposed to the innovation. So what I learned there um, is they were a very innovative company, but I learned how I didn't want to innovate myself. Was this StageGate? It was StageGate. Yeah. Yep. So StageGate project management is basically where you take a process and you put it through a, a really pretty regimented structure of decision making, right? Correct. And so you implemented that stage gate process where you start a stage, you might have an idea stage, right? And then you have a gate. Yep. And the gate is, I gotta meet with, what, 15 people, four people, 12 people, Yep. say, here's where I am, can I have approval to go forward or not, right? Kill yep. it, don't kill it. So did that process, I mean, you would think that with that many people and that many things, you would have to put it through a process. But you think that kind of stifled innovation a little bit or not it did and people yeah. hated it right okay. so innovative people they don't want to go through committee after committee to get their idea approved and funded um, you know looking back that's how the real world works but instead of being innovative it became more of you know risk management process so when you're a a 20 billion dollar company you got to man manage your risk all the way through 
that's not how I want to innovate, right? When you're a startup, you know, you take a lean startup methodology. You try it, you know, you, you see if it fits in the market, you see if you're getting traction. If it doesn't work, then you pivot, right? Within a large organization, they have to manage their risk from stage to stage and gate to gate. So honestly, what it told me is, it's, I, I, I kind of know where good ideas come from, but I don't want to have those type of processes, at least early on, at least early on in the way that I personally innovate. So then Halliburton, how did you get in Halliburton? Yeah, I was, I, was giving a, I was giving a talk on innovation in Quebec, Canada, and the senior vice president for their completions production division happened to be in the audience. Um, he, uh, he approached me afterwards and said, hey, here's my business card, you know, give me a call. I thought I would never leave NOV ever. I thought I was gonna be there for the next you know, 30 years of my life. I loved it so much. Uh, he made me a couple offers. I told him no a couple times. Um, after the third offer, uh, I had to take it. There was there was no not taking it after the third offer. And yeah, he made me uh, he put me in charge of strategy for uh, two thirds of Halliburton. So that lasted what less than two years before you found this idea. It lasted a year. So I was okay. in a program, actually a, a joint program between Texas A&M and Halliburton. So Texas A&M and Halliburton have a very, very strong relationship. And it was called B Business Leadership Development. And so they're going, you go through this program and they're trying to identify, you know, the next leaders and they're trying to give them, it's almost like an, a mini MBA. And I'll never forget, I was, I was sitting in the class and it's, it's a very well-respected program. It, you, you almost, ha you have to go through it to get to that next level within Halliburton. That's how serious they take it. And I was sitting in the class and one of the professors, he, he asked a question to the audience. Um, you know, it was, it was around being a driver versus being an influencer, being versus collaborative. And he had everybody raise their, or we did a, you know, an assessment and everybody raised their hands if they were a driver. So the entire audience raised their hands and said, you know, I'm a driver. Uh, I was the only one. So like out of 30 people, I was the only one. I'm like, oh man. I don't know if you know this story, you know, about Sodom and Gomorrah, where, you know, you know, God destroys these cities, but he says, if he can find that one righteous person, I, you know, I won't destroy the cities. I wasn't lo necessarily looking for a righteous person, but I was looking for someone that I knew was successful within Halliburton that I could actually emulate. I knew at that moment I had reached the top of the corporate ladder <laughs> that I would ever reach. Uh, and I, I knew there was no, I knew there was no going any further than that. Yeah. And um, you know, I had a lot of aspirations and ha having that, you know, having that uh, awareness, knowing that I wasn't going to get any higher was actually what triggered a lot of things. Yeah. So, but you've seen, a, you'd, by that point in time, you'd seen a lot. You'd seen how to innovate, how not to innovate, how things get squashed, how things get, you know, risen up and how people were supportive, how people were not supportive. So how did you know you had the right idea? Tell us the story about discovering this idea. And how did you know it was the right idea for you? Well, I'm, I'm still wondering if it's the right idea, but. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, um, the first company I started was called Verisay International. It was actually originally called the Coffee House Group. I called it the Coffee House Group because my dad's first mission organization was called the Coffee House. And it was a place for people to gather. Uh, in, in that case, it was you know not to talk about ideas, but it was to talk about religion, ch challenge each other, talk about Christianity, et cetera. So that's, that was the original name of it. My, it. I didn't really have a plan, honestly. So I knew I just wanted to get out. My very first customer was a church in New Braunfels, Texas. So we did a, it was a pro bono work. We did uh, what, what we called Voice of the Congregation where we you know, pulled the congregation, we talked to the congregation about you know, what, are the, what are the drivers for either staying at a church or uh, joining a church. And then from that, you can develop a strategy, right? So we, we did that. Um, they actually increased their attendance by like two times within you know, a very small amount of time. Had nothing to do with me, it was probably I mean, definitely do with you know higher power there, but nonetheless, I had a case study, right? So I didn't put Jesus's face on the case study, but I had a case study. I took that case study back to Halliburton um, and I went to the CEO. After you, you're, you're quit, right? Yeah. You started this. Okay, good. Yep, th about three months later, I take it back to Halliburton, um, take it to the vice president of one of their business units. And I say, hey, you said, come back when I have a case study. Here's my case study. <laughs> 
he, he laughed a little bit and he said, okay, you're hired. So that was my first consulting opportunity. Um, you know, they, they paid me about $50,000 for, you know, a six week engagement, something like that. And then from that, that became, you know, my seed money, um, for a lack of a better word. We got ingrained into the Halliburton system. So we were working across all of the product service lines, all across the business units. And then once you have that and you know, major cash flow coming in, you can expand. And then going back to my times at AM and Rice, a lot of, you know, a lot of the knowledge that I have, a lot of the, the frameworks about thinking about things are not my own. They came from professors, they came from academics. So it created a consulting company where we used academics and professors as our subject matter experts. Cause frankly, I don't have a whole lot of knowledge, but I knew these professors did. So we leveraged, you know, we leveraged their knowledge and the secret sauce was we actually leveraged their network. So they would actually bring in business to us because now they have thousands of MBAs out there who are in, you know, leadership positions who want to hire their favorite professor. So we created a network of about a thousand professors that were just bringing us business, uh, you know, left and right. So we had four pillars. We had minders, which were the professors. We had binders, which were the business development people. We had finders, which were actually going out and seeking, you know, new accounts. And then we had grinders who were the people doing the work. And then we would, we would form small teams and, you know, we would com honestly, we would be competing with the McKinsey's, we'd be competing, you know, with the Accenture's. Uh, we created a JV with Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um, so we used a lot of their resources. And then we had, you know, we had an event um, as well from, a, from an exit financial standpoint with one of the consulting companies as well. That's so super cool. So I want to try to paint this picture. So where were you when you told your wife that you were leaving Halliburton to start a pro bono consulting firm? <laughs> Yeah, she didn't question me. Um, she, I don't know, I don't know what it is about Does her. Does she but, speak English? Uh, I mean, <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> yeah, we, we went, we went two years without having any personal financial income. Um, we, we had three kids, no income, uh, you know, at least from my side, you know, uh, fixed, fixed, not high fixed costs, but we definitely had some fixed costs there. So yeah, the savings account went way down, uh, stress went way up. Um, you know, luckily her belief in me got me up in the morning and it actually converted into, uh, you know, cash that we're, we're happy with now. There you go. Yeah. Good for you. So, um, so to bring us up to speed on, on the nano shield and, and nanotech. So you're doing your consulting work. Uh, when did you fall into, as you said earlier, the, this idea? Yeah. So, in, well, I'll back up. So in 2017, Probably one of more, my more interesting companies, we have a company called Hopdrop. So Hopdrop does craft beer delivery from the brewery to your door. And we work in Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. And we're you know, about to create some big strategic partnerships to take us nationally there. Uh, while I was doing that, uh, I was also doing the consulting work. And the consulting work, you know, I was using academics and researchers and professors. I got connected into our now chief technology officer who had this incredible technology that I knew absolutely nothing about. He came to me and said, Hey, can you, you know, can you get this commercialized for me? I'm not kidding you. I almost didn't take the meeting and it wasn't even for a good excuse. I was tired. I was tired and I wanted to take a nap. And so he would, you know, he was there at the Starbucks or it wasn't Starbucks. It was, it was a, another coffee shop. I was like, Oh man, I, I don't know if I should take this. I know nothing about this. I know nothing about nanotechnology. I know nothing about material science. Um, but I went ahead and took the meeting. He showed me a video of his hand coated in our nano shield technology, and he had an oxy cutter to it. This thing cuts steel, and he put something that cuts steel directly to his hand. And I said, Holy cow, we're going about this the wrong way. I don't know exactly what I'm looking at this, but you're not going to hire me to do commercialization for you. You're going to hire me to raise you a bunch of money. You're going to quit your job. I'm going to sell my companies. We're going to go all in on this. That was about a year ago. We formed the company about a month after that meeting and we built our founding team from there. That fast. That fast. So you knew it that fast. Absolutely. Okay. Would you have known it when you were 23? No way. So I, I think the maturity that happens when you go through like a corporate job or you go through any other job other than being a startup, 
gives you some contextual intelligence, right? The contextual, I'm still developing it. I don't have, I don't have it. I'm, I'm getting there. You know, I'm, I'm right maybe 51% of the time, but that contextual intelligence that you develop by, you know, doing normal jobs until you get to the point of flipping the switch allows someone like myself to see something. And I may not know what I'm looking at, but I've developed just enough contextual intelligence to say, man, we should go after this thing. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's a market, right? So Tim Draper was here, what, two months ago, a month and a half ago, April 15th, and he was, you know, getting pitched, 12, 12 different companies pitched him. And you know what the question he asked most often that day was, how do you make this a trillion-dollar industry? He wasn't happy with billion-dollar industries. He was happy with trillion-dollar industries. So my guess is this is at least a trillion-dollar industry out there in terms of fireproofing, things around the world and insulating things around the world. Yeah, so the, the fireproofing market yeah. in and of itself is a you know $500 billion market. Uh, the insulation market is another four to $500 billion market. We're combining those. So our, sing our one technology is both fireproofing and it's insulation. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to be like the iPhone of materials where we're bringing the fireproofing market with the insulation market and trying to create a new market in and of itself. Our, co our competition's terrified. Um, you know, everybody that, that we're speaking to is really excited. I've never worked on anything or done anything where I don't have to, I'm not the one doing the cold calls. You know, we have the biggest companies in the world cold calling us because they see that what, what's gonna happen here if we do it correctly. And honestly, that's what keeps me up at every single night. I know what we have and I don't wanna screw it up. Right. I don't wanna screw it up. Yeah. Well, but it's okay. Yeah. Right? You're not going to screw it up. So editorial comment. I get to make editorial comments from time to time during Startup Grind. And, and so one thing to notice here is that um, he didn't ask, why did it show up in my hands? Why did all of a sudden this meeting come to me? Right? And why didn't they take this immediately to uh, Owens Corning? Why didn't they take it to the largest insulators, the largest fireproofer companies in the world? Why am I sitting here at Starbucks and the guy that has this technology and owns this IP and is the smartest guy on the planet on this thing is talking to me? Why? Sometimes you don't ask the question, right? Sometimes you say, it's okay. The question is, is who am I becoming and can I do this? Am I capable of doing this? Do I have the capabilities? Can I put the right team together? more importantly, right? The, the capability might be putting the team together, not necessarily being the material scientist or being the IP attorney or being the marketer. It's, hey, yes, I know that person, these people, those companies, yes, we can do this. So you immediately said to your, in your head, I can do this. And that's a huge, huge um, you know, part of this game is to go, I have the self-confidence, not the cockiness, I have the self-confidence to say, I recognize it and yes, I can do this. So congratulations on that. That's my editorial comment for the group. Um, so going back to that meeting at Starbucks, how did, didn't you not question that why, I mean, I mean, just after I just said all this, right? Didn't you not question, does this guy really have this? Does he own this? Why is he talking to me? Did you have those doubts? Yeah, I mean, you have you have doubts along the way, um, and that's where you know that's where the experience of doing due diligence on on ideas comes into play. Uh, you, you don't just you know jump in. I mean, I guess we did kind of with this One thing, month. but yeah, you don't jump in. You but just but we, wait a month. We we did the due diligence, and and same with Hop Drop. You know, Hop Drop. We we knew that there was a market there. No one was doing alcohol delivery at the time. We didn't have a huge plan, uh, but we bought a truck, we put our logo on it, and we started you know, delivering beer. We opened up December 1st, 2017. Uh, it was at noon. Uh, our first order came in at 12.01, and we had about 300 orders that day. So, I mean, you have these hunches, you have these slow hunches that you get over the years, that contextual intelligence, that whatever you wanna call it, the wisdom. You also need to be wise about saying no. So even though you know I saw something, um, you need to do the due diligence. So you need to take the time to say, can we make this into a billion dollar? Can we make this into a trillion dollar? Can we quit our jobs? Can we you know stop everything that we're doing? You know I don't work on these other companies in, anymore. Companies that I started, I don't work on them anymore. You know yes, that was a sacrifice, but I believe in the sacrifice because I think of how big this can be. Yeah. And you're creating the wake, right? So the wake behind you is now somebody else's issue, yep. right? They have to asset manage those companies, but you're focused on the next thing, the Absolutely. next day. Um, how are we doing on time, Shelley? About 
about good for Q&A, you think? Um, yeah, so, uh, no, I appreciate all this. This is, really, this is really helpful stuff, Mike, and congratulations on what you do and how you're doing it, and you're making a and proud and Rice proud and all those great things. Um, so any questions for Mike? Yes, sir. Clothes. Does so we can embed it into cotton. Um, we actually have a version that can. This is kind of separate, but a material that can be uh, bulletproof to a 38 caliber point blank range. Uh, so yeah, you can embed it directly into cotton. You can develop uh, embed it into a lot of uh, different fabrics, couches, what have you. So yes. Yes. Sir. Wait, I, I'm sorry. I was. I'll let you go after this. Yes. Correct. Licensing IP and the big investors don't tend to like that. Uh, they want you to own the IP. So that's not a hurdle. You had to overcome the IP from the get-go. Yeah, we own the IP from the get-go. Um, so the first we we filed the first patent when we formed. So we knew that we were going to raise money. Um, so we you know we started out as a, a, a corporation because you're not going to be able to raise a whole lot of money if you're an LLC just for various reasons or it's kind of rare. So we formed the corporation. Um, we immediately filed for the patent underneath the corporation's name. And then the, the consecutive patents that we filed were all underneath the corporation's name. Um, we have steered away from licensing it just for various reasons. I don't think investors, I think there's a certain segment of investors that you could go after, but I do think a lot of investors you know, just want that protection that they can throw money at if they need to protect it. There was some money over here. Yes. Two, two questions, actually, two part. Uh, one, the insulation value. You're talking about the fire protection side of it, but from one standpoint, the insulation side of the product on glazing, for instance, uh, energy savings separate. Is can you can you apply this as a translucent window film, if you will? Uh, that's in our pipeline of R&D. So we have a prototype that's translucent. Uh, it's not fully commercial yet. Uh, the, are you, I guess you're familiar with insulation values like R values and K values. So our, if you're familiar with a K value, which measures thermal conductivity or heat transfer, our K value is 0 0.017 watts per meter Kelvin. So that, yeah, so you didn't see his face, but guy, guys that get it, like their faces. Uh, so, th I mean, that's the lowest thermally conductive, con conductive material commercially available. And we meet the technical commercial envelope. You know, so we just, uh, you know, we, we did a roof the other day. We charged them about $5,000 for their roof. And now their roof is going to have about 90% more efficiency because the heat's being reflected away and has a low thermal conductivity. You know, we're working with, you know, big companies um, embedding our molecule in, into it. So you could have the best technology in the world, but if you don't meet that technical commercial envelope, you'll never get it to market. So for, you know, our values within, you know, within the dry, if we embed it directly into drywall, the drywall itself will be about an R30. Um, within our material itself, so our coating, it's an R4 per millimeter. So that's the equivalent of about seven inches of spray. So five millimeters is the equivalent of about seven inches of spray foam. So uh, to follow up on that, just on the coat side, how is this, how are we, as an architect, developer, builder, uh, creating coat compliance with the material that's new? Because I mean, you know, the assembly has to be rated two hours, one hour, four hours, whatever. How, how can you get to you know, making that happen for code standard? Yeah, so we're throwing money at it. Um, so yeah. Testing a bunch of stuff, probably. Yeah, so, so if you're familiar with ratings, we're A rated on ASTM E84. So we produce no smoke, no flame spread on about uh, a dozen different substrates. We have eight assemblies that are one, two, three, four hour rated. Uh, we've passed military test. Sorry, go ahead. Well, but that's, that's a curiosity because it's not really an assembly. I mean, it's, it's a is an additive to an assembly, right? And so from the assembly test, you just put on whatever and it makes that assembly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what we did is we took, and so for those that aren't familiar, like an assembly is, you know, everything, it's the drywall, the studs, the fiberglass behind it. So what we did is we took eight assemblies that were, you know, um, fire rated assemblies. So a lot of times they had two sheets of fire rated drywall in order to create that firewall. 
we removed both sheets of the fire rated drywall, put a normal sheet of drywall on there and then sprayed our coating at three millimeters on top, top of it. And then that's how we achieve those ratings. So we have wall ratings, we have ceiling ratings and we have floor ratings. Uh, we've also passed uh, multiple offshore tests. So now we can replace the metallics on every rig offshore because we don't produce smoke and we can fireproof composite materials. So you can use fiberglass, you can use any composite that you want coated with our material. You don't, you no longer need metal on rigs because it's coated with our material. Uh, we've passed four military tests. Um, so we have one more test that we need to pass and we'll get about 26 Navy ships. Um, that replaces copper nickel pipe. So instead of really expensive copper nickel pipe, you have either fiberglass pipe or even PVC. Uh, and copper nickel pipe is about $25 a, I think a foot, where we can get it you know, to about $2 a foot. So if you're just a straight up commercial developer right now in the, in the built environment, right, with these, you know, your traditional wall sections and you've got sound transmission, you know, coefficients and all these things, um, are you competitive cost-wise to a traditional wall system in terms of fire rating and those things, or is this still really expensive and you're not quite to the, um, you know, the cost efficiency on it yet? No, we're, we're, com we're commercially viable. So okay. we're not, we're not going to be as cheap as fiberglass. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're not going to be as cheap, but, but we're cheaper than having two sheets of drywall hung. Really? Okay. Um, so instead of hanging two sheets of drywall, you can pay for a normal sheet of drywall and spray our product on top about on top of it. And it's comparable. Um, it's from, not only from a material cost, but also from a service and installation cost. And a weight. And a weight. Cost. You're adding what, five to 15%? Something like that, depending upon the thickness. Yep. And so your your trucking expense, your just the weight of the structure, all those things are coming down. Yep. And okay. we're we're insulating. So every you know reefer truck that you see on the road, uh, as as well as the stainless steel, they're about forty five foot, foot. We're insulating those. Um, the reason that you know we we're we're working with them so quickly is because. They, they're not necessarily refrigerated. They just have insulation and they'll put things like orange juice in them and it, they just say go. And that's how far you can go is until the orange juice goes bad. Right. We can increase the range that they can go by about 35%. Wow, incredible. Can I bring my uh, stainless steel cup that I put my coffee into? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're Yeti. We can burn it too. <laughs> so um, I know there's more questions, but real quick, let's talk about your $5 million raise from Ecliptic Capital. So what was your, your uses of funds for your $5 million raise? It wasn't my salary. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, so it, the what's another really cool thing about our technology is it's very scalable. We started this out of my, or one of our partner's garage. So if you look, if you look at it, you know, we'll, we'll Whenever we, you know, hopefully make it big one day, we'll show pictures of the garage. It's, you know, it's truly just a, a garage. It's a garage startup. We sold our first product out of my uh, beer tank that I used to do home brewing in. So it's just like a 10 gallon, you know, kettle that we sold to a Fortune 500 company. Like we, we had our, you know, drills in there. My beard hair was going everywhere. We're just, you know, mixing this stuff. And, you know, we made our first sale was about $15,000 to a Fortune 500 company out of a garage and a beer tank. Um, so the, the beauty of it is it's highly scalable. So what we do is we, you know, do, we uh, synthesize our own molecules. So we get stuff really hot. We, you know, make it really small. We do some chemistry to it. Then we get it uh, into a mix. So when you think about scaling up, it's really just, larger on the front end when it comes to the synthesizing of the molecule and then larger on the back end when, when it comes to mixing the molecule into something. So we can produce about a million gallons a year right now. Uh, we're in the process of building our next plant, which will be able to produce about 25 million a year. That'll, we think that'll hold us for about three years uh, and then we'll need to figure something else out at that point. And what's your employee count growth? What do you anticipate there? We think we'll have close to about 30, 30 full-time people, uh, you know, this time next year, um, depending on how fast things move. Um, you know, in, in 22 months, you know, I wouldn't be sh surprised if we have about 100 people. Yes, on primarily sales or in primarily manufacturing? We'll have operations, business development, account management. So on the account side, if there's anybody looking for a job, on the account side is a huge need. We 
we are working with 35 Fortune 500 companies and the cost of screwing one of those up is pretty high. And we have screwed a couple of them up um, just because we don't have the resources for it. So we're, we're scaling up in terms of not only our, our physical production footprint, but also our people footprint. Wow, wow. very cool. I started taking over the questions. Are there any questions from the group? Any more? Yes, sir. Do you have any idea what the half-life of your product is? Uh, I mean, it seems like the last six years it's held up completely. Uh, but whenever you're going for funding or trying to meet with some of these C-suite folks, how do you explain what it's going to look like in 2050 or 2070? Yep. So the beauty of our molecule, so the molecule itself is completely inorganic. So we know that it will last decades and decades and decades. The resins that we embedded into, the primary resin that we embedded into is a roofing resin. So the roofing resin is exposed to UV, it's exposed to the elements, and that roofing resin is rated for about 25 years. And then we're doing, we're paying a bunch of money for accelerated age testing. Uh, so that accelerated age testing runs for about six months. We're, we almost have the results, but we anticipate a 25 to 30 year life. Incredible. Joe. So you said you're, uh, you know, you got 25 to 35, uh, 4,500 companies that you work with. Do you have one specific industry that you're more focused on than others, or are you guys just kind of torn in every single direction, like, you know, highest bidder kind of deal? Yeah, so honestly, that's been the challenge, because I've always been, like, go for the fringes, pick a segment, dominate the segment, go somewhere else. And honestly, that's been our biggest challenge. We're dealing with the insulating market, we're dealing with the fireproofing market, and Every industry needs insulating and fireproofing, right? Every industry. And so we've, at this, at a, I would never do this in any other company, but we've played the field across all of them. One, we've had a lot of lessons learned. So we take a lot of lessons from one and move it over to the other. The commercial construction industry is the largest, um, you know, followed by chemical and oil and gas. And that's kind of where we're putting most of our resources in. But then we're also working with the supply chain that sells to the end industry, right? So we're working with the biggest chemical companies in the world because every resin, paint, polymer that they sell can be embedded with our material. So at some point you say, do you want to go to the end customer and create this infrastructure that you're gonna need to support? Or do you wanna go to the DAOs, the BASFs, the you know, what have you, and that's how you get to market. And honestly, we don't know the answer right now. So we're, we're, playing, we're playing the field as to which way we go. But I would say don't do that typically. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Um, any more questions? Because I think we're about done with our time here. We promised everybody. But, um, but I, what, a, what a great story. I uh, appreciate you being here. Um, I always think of, you know, people like you and go, what a great country we live in to be able just to, a year and a half ago, you, would, you weren't even dreaming of this, nope. right? Absolutely 18 not. months ago, you're not even dreaming of this. Now you're up here at, at Startup Grind. About to be world famous because Shelly's going to put you on the YouTube channel all over the globe. So, um, so if you are if you are successful, it's going to be because of Startup Grind and Absolutely. Lake Walk Innovation Center. So yeah. uh, give us a little bit of credit, will you? Absolutely. All right, Mike, yeah. appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Much.